everybody, welcome to the True Wealth Show. On this, the greatest Tuesday you've had all week. I'm your host, Dave Littlejohn, in studio with me today. Matt Dixon. And, as I like to say, have we got a show for you. Because you well, know what? There's a lot of stuff going on Yeah, right no now. kidding, because the markets are giving us a show this week. Yeah. Like a show of force in the wrong direction. Yeah, definitely uh, I mean, a little Today was problem. a little relief, yeah. but geez. Whew. Matt, yeah. what is going on? All right, so I'm going to break this down as simply as I can, and you're probably going to have to be like, what Matt really tried to say is this. <laughs> I doubt it. I doubt it. <laughs> All right, so basically a bunch of U.S. investors were going to Japan and changing in their dollars for yen. Okay. And then they were taking that yen, and they were borrowing at 0% because Japan had been basically letting people borrow at zero percent and then they were taking that money and buying u.s stocks specifically the magnificent seven so companies like google meta facebook amazon tesla like the big microsoft microsoft apple and apple i think yeah. that's the seven. let's focus on nvidia a little bit just okay this, I think by the way, this is matt's favorite one to kick a little bit it right is. now yeah, it is okay <laughs> and, and we've loved nvidia in the past but right yeah. now woodshed all yeah. right here we go so they borrow this money at zero percent and then what they did is they not only turned around and bought these tech stocks but they bought them on margin and on leverage. So a fancy so way of talk, saying talk, that. Talk, yeah. talk about what does that mean? So like if you bought on margin, right, you could take $10,000 and then use your margin to buy $20,000 worth of stock. Yeah, it, essentially margin is the credit card, yep. right? If the, And the way margin works is you're getting a loan with collateral, yep. okay? So you're using your securities in your account as the collateral right so or for, they bought with leverage yeah well which is the other one well and well that margin is how you get leverage right right but the other way that you get leverage and you still need a margin account to do this right a margin account is essentially an account that allows you to borrow money mm -hmm. and it also allows you to have the securities in your account loaned or that's borrow. A, that's a good point okay. that needs to be made. Yeah. So, so it's kind of like a loan. Right. And not just loaned on, but like if you have a hundred shares of stock, that you may that stock may be borrowed by somebody else mm -hmm. and then returned to you. Okay? Right. And it's up to the broker dealer environment to manage that element. But but we're yeah. getting a little too complicated okay. right now. So basically they margin bought, is yeah. leverage. So they bought all these kind of higher risk, I'm air quoting that stocks that had been doing really, really well. They had been making a lot of money. Yeah, in fact, on paper for the last year or two, they would look low risk if you mm -hmm. were just measuring the downside well, volatility. Let's just, for easy numbers, say the stock went up 10%, right? Mm -hmm. But if you had leveraged it, and say with twice the amount of margin, for example, so if your asset grew and grew by $10,000, but you had used margin times two, maybe you're now making $20,000 instead of just 10,000. Yeah. Right, so the it looked really good, but you also get bit if the stock moves down twice as hard, right? Yes. Yeah. And I'm, so, I'm, ge I'm getting ready to like explain all this. It'll be fun. So what happened was, you know, we saw stocks slide maybe 10% yeah. on these growth stocks. Well, instead of just a 10% loss, that's a 20% loss, and then, you extrapolate that out with they now have this margin call where they have to pay back money that's due. Mm -hmm. So what do they have to do in order to get access to money? They had to force liquidate the stocks that they were holding. And how does the stock market work? Yeah, so uh, the balance of supply and demand, exactly. right? So we just had a uh, supply glut and a demand de decrease. Right, so everyone's having to, well, all these big hedge funds and other big investors are having to sell, 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 sell in order to cover the debts that they had. Well, they did that. And so now we see the stocks fall even further. And on top of that, now they have to go convert their yen back into U.S. dollars in order to make those payments. Well, guess what? The yen appreciated 11% over the dollar in just that short little window of time. So now they get dinged on the way out too. Yeah, so let's think of it this way. Um, you, the same way that if you were buying a house, right? You actually buy a house with leverage. I mm -hmm. need 20% down to buy the whole house. Right. And then I have to make payments on it, right? I have to pay interest. 
Yeah. Okay. The same thing happens in a margin account. The difference is the equity in your house is cash in a traditional mortgage. Right. But the equity in a margin account is actual equities, right? It's like your stock holdings. Yeah. So let's say I buy Google and in the account and then I hold it and that's my collateral. And and so I have $100,000 worth of Google and then I can borrow another $100,000 and go buy more Google. Right? But Google just so, went down. So now Google <laughs> drops in value by 10%. My original 100,000 is worth 90,000. I have to sell $10,000 of my Google stock to bring the account back up or close to it, right? It's a little less because I'm going to sell it and then I'm going to not have as much money in, in Google anymore. But what's going to happen is I'm, I'm going to sell to meet the requirement to have enough equity against mm -hmm. my loan. And then I'm have a little bit less of a loan after I sell. Right. But I just flooded the market with more shares of Google and nobody wants to buy them. And everybody else in the same boat as me is looking for somebody to buy at the same time and nobody shows up to buy, which means the price drops even further and oopsie, now I didn't have 90,000 of Google, now I have 80,000 of Google. And I have to sell even more to meet the margin requirement and so it becomes a feeding frenzy of great, I have to sell even more. which is going against the market and, and you, you can get what we call a short squeeze. That's really the term. It's like yeah. the stock's going the wrong way and you have to sell it anyway in order to meet this margin requirement. And then to make matters worse, oh, I forgot the money I put on margin was borrowed from somewhere else and when I originally got the loan, it was a great deal, but that loan went sour on me and now I have to pay back the loan even more than I took it out for. So it's like I lost money on the stock and I had to pay back the loan at a higher cost. Guess what one of the big triggers was that caused all of this? If, uh, Japan uh, <laughs> decided that they weren't going to hold at 0%. They were going to up the the rates and so it was just like a quarter of a percent like it was, 0.25 it was, percent it, it was, was less than that because the, the the rate started at 0.1 yeah. and they moved it to 0.2 so it's 15 basis yeah, points exactly it was a 15 basis point move and it was an 11 percent move or I, I think it may have been as high as 16 percent move in the currency right afterwards. and how much money did that affect globally <laughs> oh the estimates were on the low end 500 billion to the high end four trillion yeah. with a T. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, oh, we ran man. a bunch of math on this one behind the scenes. and We did. Um, that got interesting. It really did because it suggests that we've felt a lot of the pain, yeah. right? Like, like that we've probably seen a lot of the market price adjustment has probably been priced in. And I use air quotes because the stuff is not really predictable. No, because right? like it said, maybe there's another 50% more margin call left in yeah, this thing. Yeah, that needs to be unwound. Right, and so, so yeah. the yen to dollar could change a little bit more. Yep. It could, but did the market already price in that remaining 50%? That's the big question. I'm like, does it already know? Right, and uh, <laughs> there, you know, the, the efficient market hypothesis would suggest that, well, of course it already knows. Mm -hmm. I think that that's, um, the more I learn, think about the efficient market hypothesis, the more I kind of shrug my shoulders and go, okay. Like even if it's true, the market knows everything that's knowable about the price of a stock in the reflection of its exact price. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't account for the fact that in mere fractions of a moment later, new information will come along and the market will have to absorb that too. So it's basically saying, well, it doesn't matter what the price is. The knowledge is already in there, mm -hmm. so you're not, so so then it's like okay, well then, who's the best at predicting the future? Because if the market can only price what it knows and it doesn't know the future, then the best, I guess, projections or the you know the, the best forecasting would then theoretically be a really good complement to the efficient market hypothesis. Right. The flip side of it is. What we if it really know. isn't efficient, right? Yeah. What if it doesn't know all the stuff in the price? And I think that's kind of true. Like, we don't all get information at the same time. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. It takes a while for information to travel. It's a lot less than it used to. Yep. And that's why I think you can look back to some of the other, you know, maybe market crashes. That's an extreme term. But 
market corrections, probably more accurate, um, they used to take longer, right? Because information traveled slower, but... Ah, uh, the old internet, the, the broadband yeah. theory. Well, how long did it take you and I to just get to the kind of the bottom of this thing today? Yeah, well... 20, 30 minutes? Yeah, which was still significantly in faster. The, it would have been weeks ha, in, what, in what, early in my career. What would that have looked like for us in the 80s? We would have been looking for a newspaper article. Well, or you, you know have I mean? to had your. So this was the advantage that a lot of mutual funds used to really tout was, hey, we have analysts on the ground. Like, oh, we don't. We have our research people in China. They mm -hmm. go and like walk the floor of these Chinese companies to give you a sense of which ones are the best. And then get on their dial-up phone and call it back. Yeah. And while I still think there's some benefit to like boots on the ground research, like I mm -hmm. think that's real. Um, I think that it is less uh, less important than it was couple decades ago when information right. moved the, at the speed it did. Yeah, but you've talked about this on the show before. One of the big pieces is the market hates exploits, right? Like it's, it's going to figure it out and it's going to correct. Why does information need to travel fast? Because these computers are doing a lot of trading. And if the information can come in quicker, you can get ahead of the curve yeah. and make better trades. So it's the market has basically been forced into trading based on the most current information. And so yeah, it would or make sense. if I twisted that around, because I think you're right. If I twisted it around and said that we trade faster because the information is faster, mm -hmm. right? So I don't. It doesn't matter. Is it a chicken or an egg? Did the information go faster because, right. or? because the information goes faster, we do this. And it doesn't matter, it's an academic discussion. What we know is that the information gets baked in super fast. What was really wild to watch was the um, Japanese index, right? I, for, I don't even know how to pronounce it. It's their 225 index, but... Um, oh, the it, Ian Sang or something like that? It starts with an N. Oh, the Nikkei. Yeah, that one. Um, it dropped over 12% in one day, which was like one of the worst crashes that market's had, I think, since the 80s. Yeah. I could be wrong. Yeah. Don't quote me on that. But what was wild is the following day, once all that information processed through, it was up 10% the next day. Yeah. So it's like, whoop, and it's back. Yeah. I, I will say, even if the markets are efficient with information, I still think that traders, just like judo, sometimes take the momentum of the market and pull even farther than it wanted to go mm -hmm. and then the market has to kind of correct itself from there. Yeah. So anyway, um, interesting stuff here. Uh, I think that there's more to explore but as I look at my watch I realize we're kind of running a little long. Well what so, are we going to talk about when we get back? Well I think when we get to the flip side of this one um, we got to talk a little bit about how the Magnificent Seven kind of warped their way through all this, too. Okay, let's do that. Well, stick around, we'll be right back. I'm Dave Littlejohn. And Matt Dixon. We got True Wealth on News Radio 99 FM and 1240 KQEN. Hey, welcome back to the True Wealth Radio Show. I'm your host, Dave Littlejohn. Joining me today, Matt Dixon. Um, Reminder, we're, we're talking today about, you know, markets have had some kind of chaotic activity this yep. week, some, some big swings up and down, a little bit of unpacking what we think is driving it. But we do want to get into some of the, the key elements of, like, how do you navigate this? If sure. you're wondering what we already talked about, great opportunity to grab a podcast. And mm -hmm. so you can go back. This will be available. We got the cameras up again today, so we'll get it posted on YouTube for those of you that follow us there. And you can hear the rest of the program. So uh, do that. And also, you can grab it at our website. So that's littlejohnfs.com. And um, I'll, I, maybe I shouldn't even tell you it's under the Educate tab, because then you'll explore the whole site. You know, really get a feel for the space. Mm, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, we'd love for you to. Uh, also, if you've ever got questions, comments, things that you'd like us to address on air, feel free to email us at info at littlejohnfs. Com. There's also a chat bot on the um, website, so you can get to us that way. So, Matt, yeah, we were talking about the chaos of this market. Right. Um, I think for our listeners, I would really like to get your thoughts on how does one sort of navigate through this chaos? What do you do? Right. Well, one of the things that I recommend is don't make rash decisions, especially when there's volatility that enters the market. Right. Like. You've got to be. You've got to have a kind of a set of rules that are predefined, so that when things do go sideways, you can think objectively and not make decisions that are going to harm your future self. And I think that's actually one of the big kind of reasons why some people hire a financial professional is 
they might not have that discipline where it's like, hey, this is my money, I'm emotional, I'm going to do something. Whereas, you know, your advisor might be able to have a little bit more clinical approach and saying, you know, I've researched this and, okay, here's a situation where, um, you know, we had a meltdown in equities because of a currency exchange issue and a few other things. But are the economic, you know, how, how's the economy doing? Are things largely unchanged? Is it still strong? Maybe this is a buying opportunity, and that's not giving advice on today. But you know, we can look at so many different times in the past. COVID's a perfect example of one, right? Like the markets cratered what 30, 40 percent, and then recovered in a matter of what three or four months. And so, if if you are using a professional, they can kind of walk you through this, and they can also adapt. We're seeing interest rates or yields on fixed income products go down, right? Mm -hmm. um, why? Because obviously there's been some turmoil in the equities and the stocks, so people have seen a flight to safety. And so as more people are flocking to fixed income products like treasuries or CDs, we've seen the yields go down because, well, they don't have to pay as much. And so you know, what was five and a half percent like a couple months ago, maybe is 4.8 percent. And as we possibly could get a rate cut, we could see those rates go even lower. So having someone who can navigate that for you is a really big deal because what was available yesterday might not be available a month from now or a year from now. And so having someone that can adjust to changing marketplace, uh, that's a big deal. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I like to sum it up. I used the firefighter analogy on the program before that you or I run into a burning building and we probably don't come out. Firefighters probably do, and mm -hmm. it, the difference is training. Right. right? It's, the circumstance is no different, but one of them is training. Some of it's the right tools for the job. Mm -hmm. I think training's a big one, though. Well, and knowing your option set, I don't think we talk about that one as much either. For someone who doesn't really understand stocks, bonds, or even if you do, maybe you don't understand the vast majority of what's actually out there because there's so many different ways to invest. Mm -hmm. Well, and what what happens, and I think this is something that we like to do on this program too. I mean, you and I both really like the the, the wonkiness of the markets, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's a fun puzzle to try to solve. It's really an unsolvable puzzle. Right. But, you know, trying to figure out, well, what are the, what are the core things driving the market right now? Mm -hmm. And those things keep changing, right? That's that whole idea that markets abhor an exploit, and so the exploit gets washed out. But you're constantly trying to get a sense of, well, where's the, the mass or the, the, the center of mass of the target of the market? What's driving it? There's always things around the periphery, but it's always moving, right? So it makes for an interesting puzzle. And even as you hear me describe it, what does that say? It's like, oh, well, we like this stuff, so we tend to talk about this stuff. The, yep. the, I think the thing that I notice for investors is, We'll come in here and start you know, nerding out about the markets, and, and a lot of people will listen and their eyes will roll back in their head because that's not what their interest is. I think the bigger challenge is back to that firefighter concept. If you are, if you get really stressed out for anything, you, know, you, know, you go into a fight or flight response, those are not necessarily rational decisions anymore. Mm -hmm. Fight or flight is sort of panic driven. So you either, what, you, you run, you freeze, you know, you know, so fight, you fight, or, those, or freeze. Right? Yeah, you hear one of those ads on the radio for move everything to gold because you're scared, and then you actually do it. Like, I mean, we've and, seen and that that's before. Exactly, yeah. That's exactly, that's a wonderful example, right? Because yeah. it's really appealing to the fear side of the equation mm -hmm. in order to induce a sale or indu induce an action. And what an advisor should be doing is taking a step back and applying a more rational mm -hmm. or longer term response. And so the idea is through training, they're gonna be less emotionally swayed. Doesn't right. mean zero, because I mean, I still maintain, like I feel the emotions when things go chaotic. I'm like, mm -hmm. that does not feel good. But the behaviors look different because of the training. Right. And and the a lot of the studies play this out over time that usually where a financial professional demonstrates the most value is in down markets, mm -hmm. right? And so the the returns are made by a mistake avoidance, right. right? It's not that advisors outpick the markets. I mean, we've talked about, right? The S&P 500, it's hard to beat. Mm -hmm. 
it's the downside and it's the risk management, it's the tax management, it's all those other things that improve efficiencies that lead to superior outcomes over time, typically, according mm -hmm. to the data, right? I'm not, I'm not, I guess we're, you know, advisors are always pitching themselves, right? But the idea is just look at the data, it's pretty clear. You just mentioned something interesting. You said it's been kind of hard to beat the S&P 500. Yeah. But I actually kind of want to, and I know we've talked about this off air a little bit, kind of dive into looking at, you know, what does the S&P really look like if you take out those magnificent seven that we talked about earlier? Yeah. Yeah. It is, is it a fair bogey right now? Or is it a good bogey? Right. Is it good right now? That's a good question. Yeah, because I can tell you, there's, there's some elements to that that when I look at it, it well, frustrates me. Yeah, well, you know, you hear people say often, just buy the index. And we're not trying to discredit that, right? Because sometimes that's a really good option. However, what happens when you get these mega tech companies or these really big growth companies that have had a huge run? Is yeah, so, it still the so, play? Well, let's let's use this as a, an interesting opportunity here, um, mostly because of the clock, right? But hey, look at the difference between the S and P and the Dow this year. Mm -hmm. Okay, the Dow, thirty stocks that Big are companies. industry leaders. Yep. Right. Then they are they are the the the, like the Dow healthcare the largest sectors. Yeah. Right. And so you got the 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 supposedly best of breed thirty stocks in mm -hmm. the Dow. S&P 500, you've actually got like 503 stocks in mm -hmm. the index. And yet this year, at least until recently, it was the correction has, has made them closer, but as recent as a week ago, the S&P had outperformed the Dow by close to 10% yeah. for the year. Yep. A 10% gap. So you mean to tell me that by owning 503 stocks, I made more money than concentrated in 30. I want to unpack why that is. Yeah, because that's really weird, by mm -hmm. the way. Like, if you're look, listening to that and going like, huh, that's, uh, that's just not typical, and it hasn't really ever occurred before. But there's a very interesting, because what we would expect is broader diversification mm -hmm. would typically lower the overall return. Right, because a lot of companies fail. They go under. Yeah. They, they get gobbled up or they, you know, they just couldn't make it. So why is it that these 500 something companies outperform the 30 darlings? I want to talk on that. Yes. And I think this is, if you're wondering, yeah, we totally set it up. We're going to take a break. Okay. And when we come back, we're going to unpack, like, what the heck is up with the S&P 500 compared to the, the Dow? I've got a great answer for you, David. Good. Hold that one because we're going to come right back. I'm okay. Dave Littlejohn. And Matt Dixon. You got True Wealth on News Radio 939 FM and 1240 KQEN. Hey, gang, welcome back to the True Wealth Radio Show. Dave Littlejohn in studio today with... Matt Dixon. We're covering a lot of material. Yeah, yeah. Well, the markets are definitely... I mean, we started with, hey, it's a wild ride, and a little bit of uh, maybe why. You're never quite sure, but we think we have a pretty good understanding of what uh, triggered the drawdowns well, this week. Well, if the internet said it, it has to be true. That's a good point. You yeah. know, the other theory um, from, uh, you know, we Deep all know. dark state. Yeah, music. is that if somebody has a logo on their shirt when they say it, that also can make it real. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, like, logos, any kind of, if there's swag for the company, it's probably it's legit. It's legitimate. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, glad we had that talk. Mm -hmm. um, we were going to talk a little bit. So this this segment, I hope, will age pretty well. Like, I hope this will age well. It's something that will probably show up online because I, I feel like this is really important. We just monkeying around today in our investment committee started pulling some data on mm -hmm. this because we we're, we're talking about why the S&P 500 and the Dow have had such a disparity in returns this year. Yeah. Right. Typically speaking, more concentrated portfolios when the market is going up, they tend to make more money. This sort of makes intuitively, it's intuitively sensible, if you will, because a concentrated portfolio is higher risk, mm -hmm. right? So if you take on more risks, then you are supposed to be rewarded for doing so. Right. Supposed to be, okay? Now, of course, there's security selection in there and so forth, but th th this whole theory is sort of what was driving the latest uh, collapse, or collapse, it's probably an over, 
you know, abuse of the term, but like the latest pullback this week was because a carry trade, people were investing in really the seven concentrated positions in the S&P 500. Right. So if you want to understand why this matters, it's a little funky, but the Dow and the S&P, they are not weighted the same way. The Dow is a price weighted index where the price of the share influences how big of a position each company has in the index. But they're more similarly weighted than the S&P where seven stocks now account for close to one third of yep. the S&P 500's total asset value. Right. Think about that for a second. If, if one third of the S&P 500 is controlled by seven stocks. How diversified are you? That's the question, right? So if yep. those seven stocks perform twice as well as the rest of the market, mm -hmm. think about this for a minute. Two thirds of your portfolio could lose 50% and one third of your portfolio doubles and you look like you lost nothing. Mm-hmm. Right? That's a wild way to think about it. I mean, like numerically speaking, you would be right where you started because mm. a portion of the portfolio doubled while the other half, the other portion was cut in half. And so one third became two thirds and two thirds became one third. It's still three thirds. Here's an interesting thing for you to think about. So if you look at just how much are these companies like earning per share, right? Yeah. If you strip out those magnificent seven, the rest of the stock market this year would show a decline. Yeah, so earnings are actually shrinking. Right, which indicates what? Well, that's kind of a loaded question. It's a loaded question because my guess is you're thinking it indicates recession. Well, maybe not, maybe not. But, but, but slowing growth for sure. Right. Because here's an interesting theory. Could we have already experienced a recession, gotten through it, and we're walking out of it on the upside and no one even talked about it. Like, because it never was declared. We never declared this a, de a recession in so the last. So let's, here's, if we haven't done this, now I want to go run this experiment. Like okay. this, we're, we're talking about this live on air, right? The idea of, if you looked at the performance of the S&P 500, mm -hmm. X the Magnificent Seven. Right. And then you overlaid that with the purchasing power of mm -hmm. the dollar and you looked at it and said, well, if we lost purchasing power and the rest of the index was flat or negative, the vast majority of the market really did experience a recession. We just had yep. a very concentrated group of stocks. That kind of propped it up so well, it they, didn't yeah, look like it. Yeah, that bucked the trend and I, I use the term eclipse, right? Mm -hmm. Right, because when the moon, which is smaller than the sun, passes in the right spot at where you're standing, you can't see the sun anymore. Mm -hmm. And so to you, it's blocked everything out. Well, if these stocks eclipse everything else, you don't see the other data points. All yeah. you see is the effects from those stocks. Yeah, there was some really interesting charts I was looking at, and I won't even get into the details, but they were showing um, things that have happened in the past. And the charts, you know, when they got to a certain point, showed, well, there was a recession during this little window of time. And I looked back at it, and I looked at where we are today. We're kind of actually crawling out of this hole. Um, and I look at it, and I'm like, there, I think there's an actual chance that history books might look back. And say and, we're kind of in it right now. Well, even. that we passed through a recession, and no one even talked about it. I think it's well, possible. Well, I think it's possible that with this much concentration and a handful of stocks, mm -hmm. and the way we keep sort of retooling the way that we record data, at That's a government a level, one, yeah. I'm like, I well, I don't know that you can take the same indications that we had 15, 20 years ago and apply them today because uh, that's why I keep thinking, well, look if at we could strip growth. the stocks out. Yeah, just look, look at job growth as mm -hmm. an example of that. Where are all these new jobs coming from? Government sector, are they actually? Like, well, we talked about, they, they add to GDP, but they right. do it through more debt. Right. Right, so it's like, okay. Is well, it a then true reflection of the actual economy? You could debate that both ways, I guess. Yeah, but I mean, you start looking at GDP versus um, debt, right? Mm -hmm. The debt to GDP ratio right. and where those fall. But again, if we keep changing the way we measure, right? If CPI is measured differently today than it was 30 years ago. Right, it skews everything. Or 
if we have sectors that have changed, like sectors that didn't really exist, but like AI wasn't a thing. 20 years ago. True. It wasn't a big investable sector. It was an idea that like some tech companies were playing with. Right? Tech is getting so big that we're starting to break it into subsectors mm -hmm. that are becoming whole sectors. Right. Right? I mean semiconductors is practically its own sector. It really is. You know? There's like 12 big players in that. And that so you look at that area. and think, well, we call it tech. And we call semi as a you know, like subsector, but it's like tech. darn near its own sector. Like when it's Amazon. as big as Amazon's basically a tech company at yeah, this point. Yeah, and it's called look retail. Their, it's online yeah. retail, right? Yeah, you're like, come on, Google's AWS, look at this stuff, yeah. right? So you're just like, wait a second. And Microsoft, I think, is software. Apple, I think, is hardware. So it, it, you're just like, I don't even know how we've assigned these. I just know it's a giant portion of the economy. It would be it interesting to know as a percentage. <laughs> I, I don't know, right? I mean, I, I would not go by market cap for sure. Oh, gosh. Right? If you went by market cap, it's got to be over 50%. Yeah. But, but, and even revenue is kind of a tricky one to measure these days because you still look at, like, oil companies and how much revenue goes through those companies, and you're like, oh, my gosh. But then you see, like, a multiple on, on their, their earnings of, like, eight, mm -hmm. you know, ten. And then you say, well, but Microsoft said a 48. Yeah. And I'm like, huh, why is the multiple on Microsoft so much radically higher? And I some think, of it is. I think it just comes down to what are your net earnings? Because you can make a ton of money, but if you're not putting any of it in your pocket. I think that it's not just that. I think what Microsoft does is it benefits. It gets an expansion of multiple because it's in a sector where other companies that are growing fast that are in the same mm -hmm. sector are given higher multiples. And so what we do is we say, well, tech gets a higher multiple because of higher growth rates. Right. And so we just sort of lump it in with all the fast movers. And the reality is Microsoft has been a pretty fast mover, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, for a giant fish, they keep getting bigger. Microsoft's like its own bank almost, right? Oh. Like you have that much free cash sitting on the sidelines and everyone wants to take a loan from you because your credit rating's so high so you can go, you know. Here's a dirty secret, Matt. All of the giant players are like that. Yeah. If you look at a hospital system, it basically functions like a bank. Mm -hmm. All of these giant companies now are cash flow management machines. Right. Right, so yeah. the earnings that come in, there's always a huge bankability aspect. There's a huge aspect of leverage. These margin accounts, all of that, it's all mixed together. Mm -hmm. Like even, uh, oh, it's a tech company. Yes, but it, it's gonna do a lot of things to manage its finances. This is like why, this, that, and that's why you can get into these situations where it's like there's more money that's being borrowed than actually exists. Right, and it's why the Fed matters so much and it's why when you hear Warren Buffett say the derivatives market is a weapon of mass destruction, right? Mm -hmm. That that is, it's a scary place when you are creating financial instruments built on other financial instruments that may have already been built on other financial instruments. Right, because I mean, you think, a lot of people think, well, when I go and I take my money to the bank and deposit it, well, it's just sitting there waiting for me to come and get it back. It's like, well, no. It's not, because the bank just loaned it to someone, and then that institution is loaning that money out to someone else. And how many times did that money get loaned, right? Like, yeah. it's not just sitting there waiting for you. If you want a great explanation of this, by the way, uh, go to Khan Academy and look up fractional reserve banking. Oh, and it goodness. actually will yeah. explain it pretty well in a, in a very clear format. And all of a sudden, when you hear us nerd out about, like, oh, well, you know, look at, uh, the yield, look how yields are dropping, mm -hmm. okay? We always say yields are dropping, but you know what people don't say, which is equally true? Look at how the price of bonds are rising, mm -hmm. right? Why is the demand for bonds going up? Like if you own that bond already and the yields drop, someone's gonna pay you a premium. So, well, if the yields drop, yes, your yeah. bond is going up in value. And, and it's just people, it's backwards of what you kind of associate, but you know, if, if the yields on bonds are like 8%, mm -hmm. the bond looks cheap because, well, I can get 3% at the bank or I can get 8% on a bond. I'll mm -hmm. go buy the bond. Right. And that's supply and demand, right? Demand went up at that low price point. It's gonna be interesting to see in the near future, I'm talking like the next three months, where will the money move? Because 
we have seen, like we just talked about, rates have gone down. You can't go get that, you know, it's, what was 7.5% might now be 5.5%. So yeah. people are going to be less incentivized to go uh, lock up their money in those fixed income products, but there is now all this added volatility to the stock market. So where does the money move? I think it's a great question. I actually want to ask you where you think it's going to go. Okay. But first, right, I'll disclose this. One, we're not going to make predictions or recommendations. Okay. And two, we are going to take our last obscene profit break of the show. Okay. Stick Let's around. We'll be right back. I'm Dave Littlechot. And Matt Dixon. You got True Wealth on News Radio 939 FM and 1240 KQEN. <laughs> Welcome back to the True Wealth Show. Home stretch here. Uh, Matt, I want to play the game of yep. um, you are not accountable to the answer, and uh, if anybody ever says that uh, you are, we fully disclosed. We're not giving advice here. Okay. But you know, we got this. We got a lot of variables going on mm -hmm. right now. I'm putting you on the spot just a little because I think you did a great job of walking the fence this morning mm -hmm. in our investment committee, kind of talking about the pros and cons. Help our listeners a little bit with, I mean, all the stuff that's going on. What do you do with this? Like, like how do you, like, where's the market going to head? If someone said, Matt, you got to pick, I would say we'll probably see investors still leaning into the fixed income stuff, the CDs and the bonds. I think we're going to still see people leaning in, even though it's not paying quite as much as it had in the past. Um, uh, let me ask you, do you separate in your mind between retail and institutional right now? I think it's going to be both. Okay. I really do. Okay. I think that um, that market is still going to see money coming in um, just because the Fed is, looks really committed to a rate cut, and I think people are like last minute scrambling. Yeah. Right, can I throw something at you yeah. too? You mentioned this earlier. I know I'm, now I'm sorry, I'm Go throwing him off. Will you talk for a minute about, like you brought up the um, unemployment numbers, and that was yeah. kind of a surprise. Right. And what do you think the Fed does now? Well, yeah, I think with, I mean, that's one of the pieces, right? Like job growth has slowed, and there's this overwhelming looming cloud of like, did we kill the economy? And the Fed doesn't want the economy to be killed off. And so one of the things that they can do to try and prevent that from happening is to lower the rates to incentivize spending, which would in turn, in theory, pick the economy back up. Um, and so if we, and I think I looked at the numbers, it was like a 95% chance we get a rate decrease come September. So it looks highly likely. So the market's betting that's the case. The market is betting that. And I think investors, with especially with what just happened in Japan and this carry trade, I think investors are going to say, you know what, um, especially um, since the markets had a huge run early, why don't we play a little bit of safety, play a little bit of defense, kind of maybe move more into these bonds and fixed income products for a season and get some of that uh, yield while it's still available, it's really pricing in that it's going to be gone. Like the 10-year treasury is below 4% again. Like it's really slipped. But I think people are going to lock in some of that short-term stuff, the one to two-year money. And so I do think we'll see an influx there. But I also think we will see people coming back to the equities as well because greed. The market is greedy. Investors are greedy. Where does the money come from? That is a great question. Now I'm going to flip that back and say retail investor or institutional investor. Yeah. Well, institutional investor, I feel like you can almost conjure money. With rates coming down, mm -hmm. margins should expand. So I can yep. see institutions being able to conjure money to, right. be putting, to go after assets. And especially in the derivative marketplace, mm -hmm. you, know, you can basically leverage up more with lower rates. Right. And so you could see major companies buying their own stock back. Right. Yeah. Like if they're already like beat up on paper and they're like, hey, we're a solid company, let's buy up some of our own company and then hold it because if our share price rises, we just well, that made makes money. the share price rise, right? If yeah. you buy your own stock, you're taking um, supply out of circulation. So mm -hmm. same demand, lower supply, price goes up. Yep. 
So, so, or I, if you are the demand, yeah. right? You're, you're generating artificial demand would be the, uh, the other side of it. It's like, okay, right. well, we, we'll be the demand too and we'll drive. That's kind of what the Fed did when they were buying bonds, right. by the way. That's how they lowered interest rates through quantitative easing is we'll just become the demand for the market. But to answer your question, I think there are a lot of institutions from what I've been reading that are sitting on a substantial amount of cash, somewhere between 10, 16%. I think a lot of, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are doing that. And so if the stock market gets cheap enough, which we just had a pretty good pullback, we yeah. could see some money flow back in and start buying those positions back. But I think more money might actually flow into the bond market Interesting. for the short term, Yeah, yeah. Next, me, next 30 to 60 days. I could see that, especially given the, the high levels of uncertainty and the high polarization in politics right now. Mm -hmm. you know, That's the, another one. That's a good point. We're coming up on an election. People are scared. What do you the, do when you're scared? Yeah. You buy safety. Yeah, and so I could I could see that, and it's interesting because people are scared, or depending on how the polling data goes, uh, it's funny because I could see both both directions here, and and the statistics are really um, interesting here. Like uh, a lot, of, we tend to have a pretty conservative political base around here, largely, not exclusively, but largely, and uh, uh, interestingly enough, uh, the highest performing market environments have been. Democratic leadership with Republican House and Senate, mm, right? Yeah, it's true. You know, but 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 the more gridlock that exists, mm -hmm. the better the market tends to perform. Isn't that weird? Yeah, yeah. and and I, I my suspicion is it's just well we're not making a lot of changes, and so when things are more stable for business, you they don't can have plan. To, yeah, well that's true. You don't have to worry about economic policies changing, not as much fiscal change. Yeah. yeah, this is also my case for why when we hear, I have people question like, hey, what happens, uh, and we're not gonna go down this rabbit hole real far, but like, what happens if uh, Israel and Iran go to war? You know, Russia's supplying Iran now, and it looks like there's gonna be proxy war with yeah. Russia going through Iran and Iran going into Israel. And it's like, what does that mean for the markets? And, and I go, it's a human tragedy, but I don't know how significant it will be as a market mover, other than for the initial news of like, this is happening. Larger defense spending. Yeah. But, and I hear people say, oh, well, you know, what about the price of oil or this, that, and the other? So, well, I think it just sort of moves the political pressures around for right. where oil is pulled from. Well, yeah, are we really getting a ton of oil from Iran? So we don't, we get a yeah. lot of our oil from Canada. Exactly. Right? But when, what we get from Canada, then other people get it from Iran. So it's sort of fungible about where yeah. it comes from. Um, but yeah, that's the, the bigger question, if you will, yeah. is like, those are foreign policy issues, but I don't know how significant the impact to the market in the short term. David, you know. talk to me a little bit about the person who is tuning into the radio show because they're scared, they're worried about the world, the markets, and they're like, you know what, I need to get this figured out, what do I do? Yeah, okay, so if you're a do-it-yourself investor, first of all, keep learning and the more you learn the and the more disciplined you become the better off you get for the person that that's just not what you're interested in doing right and there's lots of reasons for it either you you can't you won't you don't want to all of those are perfectly reasonable reasons by the way mm -hmm. then i would say find somebody that you get along with and that you trust okay and get get aligned for some help okay and and that can just be a second opinion of will you look at what i'm already doing and and help me there uh, if it's the kind of thing where you want to actually work with someone. Like this is basically what we talk about with our firm, is y you contact an advisor, you, you usually get uh, some, th there's a certain amount of like free that's gonna come with, well just come kick the tires and figure out if this relationship's got potential. Mm -hmm. And does the, the, the culture of the, the advisor and their resources match what you're looking for? Right. And I think that's the huge thing right there is, you know, D is it a good personality fit for you? Can you work together? Can you will, and will you follow the advice? Right. But I think that it's something that you can't ignore. Right. If if you're not investing right now, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I just really think it's important. And so uh, you know what I'll say to that is, if you don't have somebody already, give us a call. We'd love to at least help get you point in the right direction. The question is, how do they reach us? Yeah, go to our website, uh, littlejohnfs.com. You can chat us on there, or you can uh, give us a phone call at 541-375-0898. You can text that number as well. Yep, so lots of ways to reach us, but the important thing is, 
to remember. Don't do nothing. Yeah, no decision is still a decision. It's just a bad one, right? right. So give us a shot if you can, but uh, we're out of time for now. So until next time, thanks for tuning in. I'm Dave Littlejohn. And Matt Dixon. You've been listening to True Wealth on News Radio 93.9 FM and 1240 KQEN.